We scientists, Rich, have thought about the possibility that maybe there is a shortest distance, a shortest amount of time. We can divide time into smaller and smaller slices. And so the question is, when you move, when you move, are you actually going through many time slices? Or distance, how, fine, how finely can you slice a distance before you hit the ultimate distance? At the present time, we see no such uh, lattice structure, as we call it, no discrete structure. We have the Large Hadron Collider, which allows us to calculate trillions of a second, which allows us to measure distances and times that are just astronomically small, unbelievably small, and we see no gradation, we see no choppiness in the structure of space and time. However, once you go to string theory, then there is a possibility that there is the shortest distance. If you take a look at string theory, there is something called the Planck length and the Planck energy. The Planck length is the size of the string itself. It is the smallest object you can create in string theory. So in some sense, maybe there is, maybe there is such a thing as the smallest distance, which is the size of the string itself. The Planck length has also associated with the Planck energy. The Planck energy is the energy of the string itself. If you could somehow access this fabulous energy, which is 10 to the 19 billion electron volts, that's a quadrillion times more powerful than the Large Hadron Collider. At the Planck energy, space and time become unstable. Now this is amazing. You know that when you heat water, eventually it boils. But what happens if you heat space, empty space? According to the theory, if you heat empty space up to the Planck energy, then space and time become unstable. They begin to form bubbles. They begin to form perhaps wormholes, gateways to other universes. Of course, we can't do this with our accelerators, but maybe in the future, an intelligent civilization will be able to harness this fantastic energy and literally become a god, literally create bubbles these bubbles expand rapidly, and they are the Big Bang itself. So in some sense, you become a midwife to the creation of a new universe. So if it is possible to have the shortest distance, it's also possible to access what is called the Planck energy. And at the Planck energy, these tiny bubbles form, and these bubbles represent gateways to other universes. That's right. Take a look at Elon Musk. I yeah. mean, he, here's a guy who comes in from, from nowhere and injects all sorts of energy, vitality, and vision yeah. that we haven't had in the space program. He wants to go to Mars by 2024. Is that at the top of your list? What's the most important thing? If you were going to sit down with the president and he said, all right, Dr. Kaku, uh, what do we absolutely need to spend our money on? What would you tell him? Well, if I had a wish list as a physicist, I want to go to the stars, mm -hmm. the first starship might be possible. We've looked at the numbers. We have a laser, a bank of laser beams that fire away at a parachute that carries a small microchip to near the speed of light. Wow. And we reach the nearest stars in just 20 years. That's and so this is doable with today's technology going to the stars. Of course, it's not going to be the enterprise. It's going to be a chip this big. Mm. But hey, you've got to start somewhere. There's no harm trying. However, the key turning point the key turning point in this whole controversy is the question of self-awareness. Robots today do not know they're robots. That's the bottom line. They have no self-awareness whatsoever. However, in the coming decades, you can foresee the time when robots become as smart as a mouse, a rabbit, a dog, or a cat, and perhaps by the end of the century, as smart as a monkey. At that point, they will have limited self-awareness. They'll be super strong. At that point, watch out. But we have time. We have several decades to go. And like I said, billionaires are waiting to be minted, waiting in, in the wings to, to, take, to take artificial intelligence to the marketplace. Okay, but looking at, uh, at that argument, um, I can't help feel, I mean, it's the old killing robots idea, isn't it? The drone robots, the robots that you send out into the field and will kill anything in its sight. And automatic killing machines. Yes. That's the danger today, but they're not self-aware. Now, automatic killing machines can recognize the human form. Pattern recognition, they can identify the human form. And if they go berserk, they are just killing machines that will kill humans in this Should we ban them? I think there should be regulations. There should be treaties. Uh, Stephen Hawking, my colleagues, have argued against automatic killing machines that are out of control. But they're not self-aware. They're not like Arnold Schwarzenegger who plots and schemes and, and connives trying to take over humanity. So that's a turning point. We do not have robots that are self-aware yet.
So, in other words, for, the, yeah. the Bush administration yeah. has long said that it's just a theory that carbon dioxide levels and temperatures fluctuate in synchronization. Yeah. We now have the proof. We have the smoking gun. It turns out if you go to Greenland, the ice sheet over Greenland has been stable for several hundred thousand years. The ice has trapped molecules of air of hundreds of thousands of years ago. We physicists have gone to Greenland and taken ice cores, yeah. drilled hundreds of feet right into the ice sheet right. to capture the atmosphere of 160,000 years ago. Hmm. We now know what the atmosphere looked like 160,000 years ago, what, right on the planet Earth. What did we it plotted like? carbon dioxide levels and temperatures, and we see an exact synchronization. In fact, I even brought the chart with me. Yeah. And if you look at the chart, you'll yeah. see that carbon dioxide levels rise and fall along with temperatures. This is the smoking gun. This is the thing that George Bush said, it doesn't exist, it's a theory, it's a myth. Why worry about the greenhouse effect? In fact, there was a cartoon I saw of George Bush. Yeah. He was in the desert with no water and the sun was baking down on George Bush and it was crawling for for any kind of, of any kind of aid. Yeah. And as George Bush was crawling in the desert, he said, more study, more study, <laughs> yeah, we right. must have more study. Yeah. I think we've had enough study. Yeah. It shows, first of all, the ice cores give us the smoking gun. Carbon dioxide levels are directly related now to temperature changes. And carbon dioxide levels are now the highest they have been in 100,000 years. On one side, we have my esteemed colleagues who are 100% certain that the universe is pointless, meaningless, and there is no God. On the other side, we have another group that is 100% certain the universe has a point, has a meaning, and there is a God. One side's right, one side's wrong, right? My personal point of view is they're both wrong. What is science? Science is based on decidable statements. If I drop my cell phone, I know it's decidable that it will fall under gravity. Science is based on statements that you can test, reproducible, decidable, falsifiable. But the question of does God exist, does the universe have a point, is undecidable. It is not part of science. It's like trying to disprove a unicorn. Let's say you want to disprove the existence of unicorns. It's really hard to do because maybe some island, maybe in outer space, there are unicorns. How do you prove that unicorns do not exist? Very difficult. Now, I'm a physicist. My goal in life is to complete Einstein's dream of an equation, perhaps no more than one inch long, that will summarize all physical knowledge and allow us to, quote, read the mind of God. So what was his point of view toward God? Einstein said there really are two types of God, and that's the source of confusion. The first God is the personal God, the God of vengeance, the God that smites the Philistines, the God that answers your prayers, the God of Moses and Isaac and Jacob. Einstein said he couldn't believe in that God, but there's a second God, the God of Spinoza, Leibniz, the God of harmony, beauty, simplicity, elegance, that the universe could not have been an accident. So I see no evidence of God. However, that doesn't mean that there is no existence, uh, there's no meaning. That doesn't mean there's not a purpose or a God out there. I just can't see it in the equations of physics. And who will be poor in the future? The countries which will be poor in the future are countries which only rely on commodities like food. Food is getting cheaper and cheaper every year. But intellectual capital, the power of the mind, is becoming more and more precious, more and more expensive. 
And that's why Colombia is at a crossroads. Colombia can leap into the future, but only if it understands the relationship between commodity capital and intellectual capital. So for Colombia, what is the lesson? First, education. We must educate people for the future. The future is going to be more scientific, not less scientific. First is education for Colombia. Second, we must allow entrepreneurs, innovators, scientists, engineers, businessmen to flourish in the future, to create new industries, new Silicon Valleys, innovation, entrepreneurs to create industries to hire more workers. That's number two. Three, the government has to get out of the way. The response of politician is tax, 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 regulate, 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 okay? That's not the way to create wealth. Wealth has to be encouraged. Wealth has to have a nudge. We have to have less regulation, not more regulation, to allow companies to flourish, to create jobs, because that's where the jobs of the future are going to come from. And fourth, fourth, the nature of the jobs will change. Less farming and more and more intellectual capital, the capital of the mind. We must have both. We have to have food, metals, commodities, oil, but we also have to liberate ourselves with the power of the mind because capitalism itself is changing from commodity capital to intellectual capital. Now you're a futurist, if you don't mind me using that phrase. Mm -hmm. you, you, you look, with what you see, what Musk has done with the cars, the Tesla, with the space, with the SpaceX, with this, what do you make of it? Is he a, is he a visionary or is he a wealthy man who's just going on foibles? Well, it's more than just a boy with a toy. We're talking yeah. about a man that sees a gap. He sees a hole and he knows that technology can, technology can fill the hole. But timing is everything. You jump in too early, the technology is not ready. You type it, you go in too late, you slow, you blow. So he knows when to jump in, in terms of billing uh, cyberspace and billing technology with PayPal, reusable rockets with SpaceX. Uh, he knows when to jump in. Ah. He says now's the time because battery power is getting 8% more efficient every year. It could drop by 50% in the coming years, and demand rises, and the two curves could collide very soon. Right, they may collide very soon, but is he going to go bust? I mean, I mean, financially, is this fundamentally a good idea that he's come up with? I think he's onto something, and I think that, you know, he, uh, he's shown that he is a businessman. He's more than just a visionary. He knows how to count the dollars. He knows uh, the bottom line is, you know, yeah, the checks book's right. got to balance, right? And so that's why, like Steve Jobs, initially didn't get both. He didn't get the technology and the bookkeeping right. Elon Musk has shown that he can do the bookkeeping. Will you watch the, will you watch the fight tomorrow? No. <laughs> Very wise. Now, the progression of time can play tricks on you. Uh, for example, I, I host specials for BBC television sometime, and we all have the illusion that in a car accident, time slows down. So we did an experiment. We got this guy, gave him a stopwatch and a camera, and we pushed him backwards, pushed him backwards off a tower. Now, if you're pushed backwards off a tower, you go screaming because you think you're going to die. Well, we had him look at images flashed at him. These images flashed so fast that the ordinary eye can't see it, like a number flashed at him. When we pushed him backwards, he saw the number. 
because time slowed down as you're falling backwards. So you can actually measure this effect, measure the effect that the progression of time slows down when you are, when, when you're frightened, when you're in a panic mode, the progression of time does change. That doesn't mean that time has changed. It just means that your neural circuits speed up, so you process information faster. You can see numbers which flash across the screen, which normally are too fleeting to be seen. To make science uh, interesting for people. First of all, we are born scientists. When we're born, we wonder what's out there. We begin to wonder about the sun, life, the stars, uh, what makes the oceans, the weather. We're born scientists. And then something happens. When we hit the danger years, the danger years of junior high school and high school, that's when it's literally crushed out of us. Those are the worst. Every little flower of curiosity, said Einstein, is crushed by society itself. Because we have to learn all these facts, figures, memorization, we think that memorization is science. And that's not true at all. Uh, my daughter had to take the Regents exam once, and she had to memorize all these facts and figures about minerals, crystals for a geology exam. Nowhere did I see the true driving force of geology, which is continental drift. That's the organizing principle for all of geology. And yet the exam was memorizing all the names of the crystals and the minerals. And then later she comes up to me and says, Daddy, why would anyone want to become a scientist? That was the most humiliating event in my entire life. I felt like taking that book and ripping it apart. Now, there is one and only one way of multiplying the lifespan of an organism, all the way from yeast cells, spiders, insects, mice, rats.